Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Testing, one, two, one, two. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Testing, one, two, three, four. One, two, three.
Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Have you got me? Yes, yes, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, can I say uh, a big welcome to everybody? It's nice to see such a, a fantastic turnout and that politics is alive and well in uh, Argyle. It's fantastic. Uh, my name's Alan Chapman. I'm sort of nominated for this role, but, you know, somebody's got to do it. Uh, and I love politics, so I'll be very interested to know what all the uh, guests and candidates are going to say today, because I don't know any of them really that well, so um, it'll be interesting for me. Uh, an explanation of and a few ground rules for the evening. Uh, I hope I'm not trying to teach you how to suck eggs on this one, but the husting will be conducted in a spirit of cordiality and respect. That's from everybody. Each candidate will get three minutes. They'll do a presentation, and this will be strictly adhered to. If you can't say what you need to say in three minutes, don't go into politics. Let's have it short. Um, we've got a timekeeper, my good wife there, lady there, Jan, who will be keeping time for us. Um, stop will mean stop. So even if you're halfway through a sentence, it's stop. Uh, it makes it equal for everybody. The candidates... Well, if they keep an eye on uh, the lady there, maybe she can just put one finger up if you have 30 seconds to go. Okay. Um, the candidates' names will be drawn at random to determine their position to speak. That keeps them all on the toes, so I like that idea. Uh, at the end of the presentation, the opportunity for questions from the floor will take place. The chair, which is me for the evening, will pick the questioner. So we'll try and make sure that everybody gets the opportunity. At the end of all, uh, sorry, not every candidate will answer every question. So we're going to split them, and I'm trying, going to try and be as fair as possible so everybody gets equal representation. Uh, to have seven, eight, nine people answering every question will be here till midnight. So that's not going to happen either. Um, so we'll split them. If anybody spots and feels that, you know, maybe you're not given enough time, please let me know. I'm fair and impartial, and that will happen. Remember, this is a local election, and questions should always relate to local issues. There will be an opportunity to raise national issues in the near future, as we all know. <laughs> so, let's get on with it. Look, I have a lottery. The first speaker is Kilo for the SMP. Well, good evening. Um, firstly, thanks to the Community Council for the opportunity to come and speak to you all, and thanks to everyone for turning out this evening. Uh, my name is Keir Lowe, and I am one of your two SNP candidates in this ward. Dunoon has been my home since I was four years old, and I've always loved it. Uh, I attended Dunoon Primary and then Dunoon Grammar School, and I now live and work in the centre of the town. I believe it's time for change in Argyll and Butte. But particularly, it's time for change in Dunoon. I believe changing our council must mean having voices that represent everyone, and that includes our younger people. By standing in this election, I hope to be a positive role model for young people, showing them that they can make a change and that their voice and opinions matter. It's through the experience I have gained growing up here in Dunoon that I want to bring my Dunoon perspective to the council, getting things done for a town that's been neglected for far too long. I want to bring a new sense of accountability and transparency to the Council. We've never seen before here in Argyll and Butte. 
It's time for a council which listens to our community, a council which is open, transparent and doing its business in public. I want to bring my energy and enthusiasm to the council, working to build a positive future for Dunoon. To do this, we need to start growing our economy. An SNP-led administration will maintain and re revitalise the Town Centre, and I believe this is crucial if we want to see increased tourism in the area. Over the past two years, through my work for our local parliamentarians, I have gained experience of public service, from getting to know the ins and outs of the council, to making connections and contacts with local agencies, I have the relevant experience that would be invaluable as a new. The SNP want communities to have a new experience of their council, one in which communities can choose to take control of local assets, make decisions and influence how their services are delivered. If this is the case, then please consider voting for myself and Audrey in a week's time. Uh, thank you, Keir. Next one out. Jim Anderson, Independent. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the Community Council for giving me this opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Jim Anderson. I've lived in Dunoon for over 40 years and consider myself a local. I'm married to Fiona, who's a teacher in a local primary school, and we brought up our three children in Dunoon. Two of them still live here with three of our grandchildren. My background is in sport and leisure, and I've worked in this industry most of my working life. Most recently, I worked as performance manager for Again and Butte Council until 2013, so I have close working knowledge of local authority procedures. I deliver presentation at council committee meetings on many occasions. My remit involved the refurbishment of facilities across Argyll and Butte at a cost of over £10 million. I currently work for Interlock Transport, a local charity which provides accessible transport for residents who need that little extra support. I have been an active volunteer in Dunoon community since I moved here in 1975 with groups such as the Dunoon Swimming Club, Kern Gala and the MOD. I am standing for election as I care about the community where my family continue to live. I have a track record of listening to the public and making sure their voice is heard. My priorities are working with others to ensure a quality education service with a structure that meets the needs of our schools. The recent Education Scotland report highlights the need for change and the new council needs to work with them to ensure that change does happen. I want to ensure the vulnerable in our community are given the care they require. We cannot allow uh, vulnerable people to be told there are no beds in the noon, but they are too Ill, not ill enough to go to Inverclyde. Staff at the hospital are given no choice if there are no beds. We need to ensure that all our senior citizens maintain a quality lifestyle by ensuring that the right care, support and transport are in place so that they can play an active part in the community. In line with the statement, I will strongly oppose the closure of Stroon Lodge. We need a transport service which will improve access and connectivity, a structure which meets the needs of both locals and tourists providing best value. We need a ferry service which will ensure that everyone living here knows that they can get to work or further education every day. Our young people need to be encouraged to take part in sport and the arts at an early age. As I have seen, this I have seen the benefits this can make, I am passionate about this and excited by our leisure facilities in Dunoon going to trust. This will be an exciting prospect as it will give Dunoon opportunities to get lottery funding which could have an impact on sports development in this area. The relaunch of the Borough Hall, refurbishment of the Riverside and the opening of the newly designed Queen's Hall, coupled with the formation of a leisure trust, will open up many opportunities which should make our town an attractive place to live in as well as to visit. I am excited at the prospect of being given the opportunity to serve the noon, and if elected, I will do this to the very best of my ability. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Bobby Good, Conservative. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for coming uh, along tonight. Um, I'm Bobby Good, and uh, I'm your Scottish Conservative and Unionist candidate. I grew up in a housing scheme in Cumbernauld, and I did various jobs, uh, from working in a bakery, driving a forklift to fabricating aluminium shop fronts and uh, windows. Uh, I even did a bit of tree planting in Dumfries and Galloway. I arrived in uh, Dunoon around eight years ago, and uh, I fell in love with the town uh, and the area. Uh, I married a local girl, 
um, who worked in the, the court. Um, and I've made the Noon my home now, and uh, it's very much where my, my future lies. Uh, I find uh, the Noon's people are uh, very passionate people, um, and uh, proud. they're proud of Argyll and they're proud of uh, the Noon. Uh, this town, uh, for me, I think is full of uh, people who want to bring and do great things uh, for the Noon, and, and I think that is uh, a great strength that uh, this town has. Um, I really want to try and encourage that uh, attitude. Uh, I do hear sometimes there's people in the town say, you know, this town's rubbish, there's nothing going on, nothing happening in the town. Um, I think that's nonsense uh, and it's just a positive attitude that the town needs. And basically that's why I'm, I'm standing, as uh, to encourage the positive attitude in, in Danoon. And, and hopefully with, with your support I can uh, achieve that. Um, I just want to uh, help the community. Uh, I'm not saying that I can change it overnight. Um, I know it will, it will take time. Um, and I can say that I will work tirelessly for the people of the noon. Uh, I don't have a, a childhood dream to chase. Um, I don't want to divide anyone. I, I just want to help the community. Um, I care about the potholes and the uneven pavements. I care about the dog fouling and then the empty shops. I care about the ferry problems and I care that the kids don't have any way to kick a ball about. I care about the support that uh, our elderly needs and uh, the, the support they deserve. Um, I care about all these things and I know that all you care about that too. My background is in public services. I'm the transport manager for the local bus service and uh, I look after the Noon Depot and Butte Depot. This role uh, involves me working with the local council in many different ways and, and that's from putting timetables together um, to looking at introducing possible new routes uh, and, and ensuring that the bus services in the area are reliable and that they work for the community. I don't have any experience in working in, in local council, however I do, as part of my daily job, I attend local council meetings uh, with uh, community groups as well as the council. So I have an idea of how it works and uh, how to move forward in getting things done. Voting for me this May will get a candidate elected as a vast amount of support behind them. Support from a party that can work together with other Conservatives, hopefully elected in other areas, providing a network of like-minded people who care about the things I've already mentioned. I just want to say, finish off, there's three people going to be elected. Um, we have to make sure that these three people can work together as a team to make the right decisions. And it's vitally important that they can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> Ross Morland, Scottish Liberal Party. Hello everyone and thanks for making the effort in coming out tonight and thanks to Eleanor for the invite. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Ross Moreland and I was born and raised in Dunoon and I've spent the majority of my life here. I work as an incident response operator for a company based out in Sam Bank and I've also got a part-time job as a waiter just up the hill there, though some of you might recognise me. Before that I've been a bartender, I'd worked in Labrooks, TSE, GTI and I spent three years working aboard cruise ships. I haven't been a councillor or worked for the council before and I didn't join the Liberal Democrats years ago. I joined less than two years ago because I was so angry and upset with the way things I've seen going, the way things I've seen, go, the way I've seen things going in Scotland and Danoon. I am passionate about this town and it upsets me to say the way Danoon has declined in my lifetime. I want that to change. I don't see my lack of experience in politics as a bad thing. I believe that the Council could use a fresh set of eyes and thinking, could use a new way of doing things. For years we've been electing people with experience and people who have worked for the Council have been Council in the past. And all I hear as I go door to door is that despite electing the same kind of people time and again, is how far people think their town has fallen and how disillusioned they have become, especially in these last five years. We have been presented with a unique opportunity. A lot of the old councillors are standing down and there's a real chance to let new people with new passion. If I am lucky enough and fortunate enough to be elected as a councillor for the Danoon Ward, I promise two things. I will work tirelessly to improve our area and I will enact real change. Change the way we do things as a council. Change from a council of inaction to a council of action. Change from a council that hinders people to a council that helps people. Change 
from a council that ignores people, to a council that listens to them again, and change from an old system stuck in its ways to a new system and a new way of doing things that is willing to embrace new ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Brian Logan, Independent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my fellow candidates, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming to listen to what we've all got to say tonight. I've lived in Argyll for over 35 years, having spent a lifetime in education, teaching in a wide range of schools from Tyree to Annan and from Inverclyde to Fife. That brings me to one of my main kind of points. Principles of curriculum for excellence are indeed sound and been very well welcomed by the teaching profession, but it's the structure that it needs to be reviewed, especially in our secondary schools. The perceived benefits just have not been apparent fulfilled. In our primary schools, our secondary sc teachers are overburdened with bureaucracy, so let's free them up to do the job we pay them for, teach. We owe it to our youth, they are our future. They're overburdened as well with the workload issue. For the, for the area, we must promote the Kill community as an attractive place to live and work. I share a lot of what's been said already. And to provide the support and infrastructure to attract this diverse and sustainable economy. The first thing we've got to do is end the bathtub ferries. We've got to bring pressure and get the replaced by the appropriate vehicle ferries, as promised by national governments of all political views in the past. And while it's great to see the modernisation of the Riverside, the Borough Hall, coming to completion, the Queen's Hall now underway, the town centre, entertainment, sport and facilities it need urgent attention. Mine, one I need is especially the stadium. Its facilities need urgent upgrading so that it is capable of attracting and continue to host major events in this area. We must also seek to get a fair settlement from Holyrood to recognise the needs of our rural communities, our 23 inhabited islands more than any other of the, the northern and western isles. And the denial of a fair deal for signer status can't be tolerated any longer. It impinges on all of our Gail and Butte's funding and services. A fair... Finally, our elderly need our support in their twilight years. Whether it's to live at home or in residential care, this must be a priority of the new council administration. The new integrated joint board should not have to start life with having to find savings of £9 million. If elected, I will campaign to keep Struan Lodge open. We shouldn't be set, shutting down a centre of excellence, as the report says. Thank you much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Brian. Audrey Forrest, SMP. Thank you. Uh, my name's Audrey Forrest. I was born and brought up in Dunoon. Uh, I went away for a while and I came back because I love it here. I love the town. I love the area. I love everything about it. I went to Kern Primary School and Dunoon Grammar School. And I had an early interest in politics. Some of you might know my dad. He was a branch secretary for National Union of Public Employees for years. So I developed an early interest in politics, although I didn't actually join the SNP until after the referendum. Dunoon has problems. We all know Dunoon has problems. But problems have solutions. And I don't think we help ourselves when we constantly emphasize the problems. We need to emphasize the problems in order to get together and work out what the solutions are. There's very few of the problems that I've heard about in Dunoon that can't have a solution. So that's about working together. It's about identifying what we need to do, identifying funding, all the things that could make Dunoon good again. Because at the minute we've got a high street where, yes, there are problems with it, but we've got one of the best high streets in terms of small, independent, interesting shops. It's not full of chains from one end to the other. We need to support these small local businesses. They are the things that make Dunoon's high street different. 
These are the things that we need to encourage and try and get more of that. As an area, craft is an amazing thing. There are people here tonight who are involved in, in crafting and open studios. These are amazing things that happen. There is a lot that happens in Danoon. I think sometimes we, we can walk about with our eyes shut a wee bit and just concentrate on, on the bad things. In terms of the council, the education report that came out recently was shocking. What shocked me about it was the council are going to make a complaint, but they said that they had rated themselves as satisfactory. And as one councillor said at, on the debate, satisfactory is not good enough for Danoon. And if that's what they're rating themselves, then we really need to up our game. And I would like to look at that again. All these things are going to require any of us here who are elected to work together for the benefit of this area. The Struan Lodge, uh, I've been involved in the Struan Lodge development group since the first time they tried to close it and I'm pleased to still be involved in that today. If I am able to be elected, I'd like to make forward actually what's happening in Danoon, not just the motto. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. John Allison, Independent. Thank you, Mr. Convener. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Convener, for inviting me to address the meeting. Thanks to all of you for giving up your Wednesday evening. I see some familiar faces, and some of you may know me already. But for those of you who don't, I'm John Allison, born in Struan Lodge and educated at the Noon Grammar School, before training as a quantity surveyor in Glasgow and attending the Glasgow College of Building. Some of you will also remember me as a local publican, owning and running the Glasgow Hotel. The reason I'm standing as an independent in the Danoon Ward is, as it says in my leaflet, to represent your voice in the best interests of the area. I'm not asking for your vote just to serve as a mouthpiece for any political party or to promote other people's policies. I'm standing to help you make this area the place you want it to be. The local council makes decisions about many things that affect people in our area, like schools, roads and pavements, bin collection, and housing to name but a few. And this is your chance to have your say. And in order to fulfil that promise to you, I have committed myself to hold regular monthly subsidies and to set up an email address and dedicated phone number where you can call to raise any matter or concerns you have regarding how our Gail and Butte Council runs our community. Of course, I have my own list of issues that concern me about our ward, one of which is the future of our Gail Street our area's main shopping thoroughfare. It has been common knowledge that across Scotland, our high streets are under threat from out-of-town supermarkets and the boom in online shopping. According to accountancy firm PricewaterhouseCooper, more shops closed in Scotland than in other, any other part of the UK last year, with at least one high street business pulling down the shutters every day. That doesn't need to happen here. So we have to use Argyle Street or lose it. And to that end, I'm proposing an, an Argyle Street forum, open to all who trade there and shop there, to come up with ideas that will make our commercial artery a more user-friendly user area. I, for one, would like to see the pavements transformed into covered walkways, because who likes shopping in the rain? But I'll make it my business to make sure the town comes up with many more ideas. Why not think even bigger and get a gale and butte to move towards bringing the cruise liners that sail up the flight into a cowl cruise liner terminal? Of course, it's just a thumbnail sketch of some of the concepts I would like to bring to the table. And if you give me your vote, I would look at my principal role, if elected as your councillor, to be making sure it is your ideas and your concerns that I represent. Thank you. Right, and it's uh, Mick uh, Rice, uh, Scottish Labour Party. Thank you. 
I'd like to start my presentation tonight by paying tribute to some of the retiring councillors. Whatever you think of Dick Walsh, he has been a councillor for over 40 years, and that, of course, is no mean achievement. And councillor Mike Bresley, he's only been a councillor for one term, five years, but he did have the merit of uniting the senior council officers as never before, because they all ganged up to gag him, and in my view, that is no mean achievement either. As has been indicated, I am the Scottish Labour Party candidate. There is only one of us in this election, so why should you consider electing a Labour Party person as one of your three councillors? Well, let me tell you this. I am first and foremost a campaigner, and I am already campaigning. I have been campaigning for the last five years in relationship to the ferry service that we don't really receive on the bathtub boats, and I've been a member of the Dunungurak Ferry Action Group. Let me say that if I get elected, they will say the powers that be in Scotland that that ferry campaigner got himself elected, he never gave up, and the electors of Danoon Ward never gave up either. A shock wave, I think, will reach the top of the political establishment in Scotland. And if there is a town that needs a champion more than Danoon, please tell me, because I don't know of one, and I believe that I can be your champion putting this place back on the map and sorting out problems. Now, the achievements that we've made as a campaigner, and there's still more to do, were done through a ferry action group that involved people from all the different parties. And so I am capable of working with people from other parties. I am a team player. The final point I would make as to why you should support me, I actually have had 20 years' experience as a councillor, in Birmingham before I moved back to this area 10 years or so ago and therefore I know how the system works and believe you me you need councillors who can stand up and tell officers what to do because too often we've had councillors who are told what to do by officers and in the end they give up and just deal with casework and don't put forward strategic ideas about how we need to change this area. So if I get elected, together, and I say together, we will campaign to try to put this place back on the map and to make Stop. a difference. Well, I've got to say that was a very impressive lady and gentleman. Uh, all more or less kept to time, and thank you, timekeeper, as well. Now, we're going to open it up to the floor, which is the exciting bit, for me anyway. As I say, I don't know these people very much, but uh, hopefully I'll find out a lot over the next hour, as whatever time it takes. Um, we're going to ask, hands up, I will then point to that person. Can you please wait for the mic to come over to you if you're at the back or somewhere, before you actually ask your question, and then uh, we'll come on, on to the, uh, onto the uh, prospective councillors here. Uh, as I said before, we're going to split it, so unfortunately somebody here might have a particular interest in education, they might not get the opportunity to answer a question on that. But there's still lots of issues to talk about. So um, let's start with who wants to ask the first question. Well, bald hand over there, please, yes, go. Hi, my name's Lachie McQuarrie. I'd just like to ask uh, the panel to tell me why they think an independent is a good or a bad thing to be as a councillor. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ross Morland, Jim Anderson and Brian Logan to answer that question, please. So who wants to go first? Um, why am I an independent? Because, I'm not, as I said in my opening statement, I've never been part of a political party. And I don't see anything you need for me doing that today. That doesn't mean I don't have political beliefs in what type of society I would like us to live in. 
Uh, if you're asking me what my politics I'm probably a centre to the left. Uh, so I presume that would rule out one of the major political parties. Um, there are times in my past where I voted uh, Labour, Liberal Democrat and SNP because of, of the time that they provided what I believe was the best thing for the community I lived in and the, or the country. Uh, but uh, being an independent means I don't have the support of the big guns behind me like the political party the people here do. I also am, am I, my, I am my own man, and I can live with you know the, my belief. I believe in. Um, it means I can also I'm free to work with anyone for the good of the Cowl community. So uh, it's my way of doing things. It may not be what they want to do, but it's certainly what I feel is important. And I hope that maybe kind of gives you a perspective of what I feel about. Um, um, Lucky, I've, ne I've never been a member of a political party, and um, my view of being an independent is, is simple. I want to be able to think for myself and act for myself. I want to be, keep a local perspective of what the people in this area want in the Dunoon ward. And it's been if I said Malith that you can work with others, I don't mind what the political party or who they are they want to work together. But I've studied, I've looked at their policies, and I, don't, I can't relate. There's things I don't. Um, so basically, my my view is quite simple. I want to represent the people of Dunoon. I don't want. But outside of Dunoon, I want to be an independent person and have my own views. I have my own views, which I've expressed tonight. And I think sometimes they get lost. People, local views get lost. Um, at the end of the day, my main concern is about Danoon as an independent person representing the views of this pe the people in the town. And that's really what's driven me. I see fantastic potential in the town. That's why I want to stay my own man. Don't get me wrong. As I've said to the candidates uh, off mic, if whoever gets in, if I get in with them, I'll be working with them. I would not be. There'll be none of this. Um, a antagonistic type of approach that I'm going to take. You need to work together. You need to be able to compromise. You won't always get your own way. But then at the end of the day, you need to be working for what the local people want. Okay. Other questions, please? Yes, please. Michaela. Let's start with uh, Keir for the SNP, please. Well, I'm obviously quite glad to come in on this question. Um, you, you know, I think one of the, uh, the, the simplest ways about this is by uh, being a, a prime example of how young people can make a difference. Um, it's disappointing to hear that people haven't been asking uh, the opinion of your son because I think in the past couple of years we've seen a, a political awakening in our young people and for the first time in a long time we have got masses of people engaged in politics who are you know, under 20, under 25. Um, on, on a personal basis, I think it's about time we start looking at issues for young people. Uh, we start looking at improving the community for young people um, and the easiest way to do that is by making sure that young people are engaged in uh, the decision making and policy making. Uh, I think there's an awful lot in uh, the SNP's manifesto that would do this through community impairment, but there's, uh, there are ways that this has to be interpreted. I would say uh, young people are certainly engaged in this election. From my experience, uh, most days when I'm out uh, campaigning, I'm joined by 20 people from every political party campaigning and working hard to ensure that we have a young voice on our council. Um, I, th I think it is refreshing. There are actually two individuals at this table who would probably consider themselves young people. Um, possibly more. <laughs> I, I, I could be wrong, there may be more. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, uh, but no, I think it's uh, the, to answer it simply, it is uh, about uh, being a leader for young people and, and positively showing them how they can make a difference um, and therefore hopefully encouraging them to engage. I hope people will forgive me on this because I think this is a very, very important question. So I'm just going to hand it over to everybody. Everybody's having got this one. So we'll start from you, sir, please, and we'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> young people, when I was young, and I know it wasn't yesterday, you, we didn't have the facilities that we have now, and I believe up until recently we couldn't book and pay for the grass parked up at the up at the stadium. I believe that's now been resolved, but you had to phone and book and look up it before you could get the the parks. Um, I would love to see better facilities, especially especially indoor facilities for the kids because if they're taking part and participating in sport it keeps them away from doing other things. I'm sorry I didn't manage to speak to your son but I don't think I met him when I was at, at your door. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, um, young people are hugely important um, for the community to, to, to listen to, and uh, you know I, I think it's it's one of the great things that uh, you know has, has happened in politics recently as young people getting more and more involved and being allowed to, to, to vote at a younger age. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, young people are the future of the community. They're the ones who are, you know, the ones who are going to have the issues future for, for us to listen to. And, and, and yeah, definitely we have to be looking at ways to encourage young people to, to come forward and get more involved in um, politics or decision making within their, their, their community. Um, so I, I, I'm all for looking at uh, ways of, of, of doing that. And, and you know, the next time I, I go to a door, I, I will make sure I, I ask that I can speak to the, the young people of the household as well to get to get their views as well. Yeah, I think it is a shame that there isn't a youth hustings in the school. And to be honest, I perhaps am at fault for not contacting the headmaster and suggesting that that takes place. But I mean, it's still not too late because the election's next Thursday, and it's possible that we could have, and I'm sure all of the candidates would attend, a hustings in the school, because everybody over the age has the right to vote next Thursday. So I think that's really important, and it would be good if that had happened. I also think that there are special issues that we need to address as a relationship to here, where they therefore we revitalize the economy, we need, I think, to ensure that as far as possible, we eradicate zero-hour contracts, which particularly are utilised to stop the young getting a foothold and a star. So we need to do all of those things. And I am concerned, of course, that young people over a certain age have to go across the water to go to college <coughs> and very often can't get there because of the bad transportation arrangements. So I'd want to see all of those things. I would be interested in negotiating, for example, special discount taxi fares so that people from Toward and in Ellen, when they're coming home at night from a night out, are able to get home relatively easily. And I think a lot of parents would be a lot happier in their own minds if they knew when their sons and daughters went out that they actually had the means to get home regardless of what happened to them when they were away. I would also like to see community... I could go on all night. I'll finish on this. I would also like to see community councils changing their constitutions and getting the support so to do to have a reserved place for young people and maybe a reserved place for old people so that we actually got those points covered and we had them involved. As an old person myself, I do have to say, the only merit that I perhaps have got is I'm not trying to climb the greasy pole or make a career of it. I'm trying in the next five years, if I get elected, to do the right thing so that when you remember me, you'll say, well, he did make a difference, because that's all I'm here for.
think the, the question was how do we engage with young people and get them involved. Um, I, in spite of nearly retiring 10 years ago, I'm still uh, teaching. I'm currently doing uh, some work in the grammar school and I approached the head of History Modern Studies the day I went back about two months ago, just after the, I decided to run and asked him was he going to do a mock hustings. The problem with that at this time of the year is the kids go and study leave for tomorrow uh, for their, their examinations for National 5 and higher and advanced higher. And the time scale just wasn't, you know, just there. It wasn't through a lack of a insight or, you know, or they should have. It has been the norm to do it. Um, I think they're going to do something for the general election. Sadly, the young people won't be able to vote in that one because that mob down south won't let them vote. In. And it's the one thing I think that I can honestly agree that I do agree with the SNP's policy of getting 16 and 17 years year olds voting on the, the independence referendum and in these council elections. We need to get young people's vote there. And as somebody who has sat in front of young people for the last 40 years, I think I engage with them because they've, you know, I walked into a class today and they said, um, I've had a paper come through my door last night and your face is on it. What's that all about? I can't tell them what to do. I can only advise them. The one thing I have advised them is get out and vote because it's important. You've been given the vote, so use it. So engagement, yeah, I think I'm doing there. Um, how do you engage the young ones? Um, to me, there's a lot of things we can actually do by engaging with the young ones. Um, the big example at the moment in this, this town is nobody realises that the thing is the school was built as a school, not just a school, but it was meant to be a community hub. That's what it was built as. So it's meant to be used, I think, from half past eight in the morning to half past six at night, and then it's over to the community. Now that hasn't really come across in my eyes. And it would be good to have a, wee, a group of teenagers um, together to say, right, what do you want on in this hub at night time? And bear in mind it's open every night of the week. And they could have all the different clubs and uh, various um, theatre type clubs they, they, they would want, but you need to ask them what they're looking for. And I don't know what the Borough Hall's programme is, but many years ago we had a youth theatre in the town and it was nearly 100 strong. So these are the kind of things you should find out what the young ones want and then see if the, how we create a programme in the town. Um, for example, the library is going to move into the Queen's Hall. So the library building is going to be empty. Is that a place that you could use as not just a community centre but a community hub for the teenagers, but I go back to the school again, that's what that was meant to be at night time. That was the principle of not having a sports centre here and a school over here. Having them both together would give you the, make it less costly to run the facility, which makes sense. But I don't, I, I know I play table tennis up there on a Thursday night um, with a, a group of people, but it's not really, it's probably um, Doreen's best kept secret that the facility is available. There's two gym halls, there's a social area, which we used at the Hustings last week. We need to get out there and say, right, what do we need? Another thing we've got with our young ones is, uh, uh, when you, I, I was speaking to somebody today, an American, believe it or not, one of the doors, and, and I said, we're having a discussion. In America, you can play sport until you're 70. All the sports, you play basketball and that. What happens in this country is you get to 18 and it's bye-bye. You can't do it anymore, you're too old. We need to create a, an atmosphere where they can play football, not just football, but table tennis, badminton, everything's available as you grow older and, you, and we keep the people in this town fitter. But the main thing is that we keep the young ones engaged. And the other thing is we're not going to keep the young ones here if we don't solve the ferry problem. If we don't have a decent ferry, they're going to end up, and I've heard this from many people from around the houses, they're just going to end up moving over the other side to get to further education or get a job. If we don't solve the ferry problem, we won't be engaged with them at all. So I think that's another issue that comes amongst the young people. But I think a forum of young people in the town, I think care touching that, is clear touching that. If we had a forum of young people say, right, there's the hub up at the school, you've maybe got an empty building, and there's the borough hall. What can we actually, what kind of super programme can we do? It might be we could get lottery funding for this, maybe the borough hall already doing it. But that's the kind of way we should be engaging with them to find out what we can do to keep them physically active. That's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with what most panel said, like Jim Keir, you know, but to actually answer Michaela's question is how do you engage with them right now is 
I don't think I've talked to yourself. I'm not going to embarrass your son even more by asking him his, asking him his name. But when you're out, it's just go up and talk to them because most of them will. You know, if you're door knocking, they answer the door, or you're out in the street, then you see they will come up and talk to you. I mean, that's all you can do right now. I agree with the, what the panel said, but that's something we, we would do, whoever's elected has to look at. But right now, all you can do is go out and talk to them and ask um, what are their issues, what do they care about, which way are you thinking of voting, why are you thinking of voting that way? Because most of them are perfectly happy to have a conversation with you. Because, like you said, there has been an awakening in the young people, but they think about this stuff now a lot more than they did. You know, when I was younger, they're, more, they're a lot more clued up. So if you, they're, they're perfectly happy to stand there and have a conversation with you. So that's all you can really do just now. And it, it's good to talk with young people because then you know what they want because you're building a town, for, you know, you're trying to make a town better for everyone, but they're the ones that are going to be living in it, hopefully, the next 30, 40, 50 years. So you need to know what they want so you're building it for the future. Is it on? William's going to regret that question because I'm not going to shut up now. He's going to be talked to until he's, he's sick of being talked to. I think we need to talk to our young people where they are. If we have meetings for young people, they probably won't come. I think we need to be going to the youth clubs. I think we need to be going through the, the, um, the, the education system allows for political education. Not party political, but citizenship, how to vote, when to vote. I'm proud to be here representing the party that gave 16 and 17 year olds the vote. And I'm pleased at how many of them are really engaging. Um, when, when they first had the vote for the referendum, my daughter is about as unpolitical as you can get. But she got really excited and her and her friends were all talking and that's brilliant to see. And the way to, to get young people engaged like that is to involve them where they are, to ask them what they need, to ask them what they want. And we can help that by making it an obligation on us whenever there's an official group like a locality planning group or a community council, as was said, to make sure that there is not just a space but that there's a supported space and that young people are actively encouraged and sought to come and take part in these things. I think young people should go away, but I think they should want to come back. And that's what I really would like to make this town, somewhere where people can go and spread their wings and want to come back. And incidentally, it's amazing the number of people of my age who went away and have come back. There's quite a lot of us. Thank you. Okay, questions please. That is a good question, and I think it's fair again that everybody gets a chance on that one. I did say, but on those sort of questions, I won't. I think we'll start the other end this time and we'll start with Audrey, just as she's about to have a drink there, but there we are. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have and will continue to stand against cuts and austerity agenda that's coming through the pikes. Um, 
we get accused of constantly blaming Westminster, but the, the fact is that the cuts are coming from there that are coming down for us. Uh, the cuts in local authority have paired things to the bone. We really need to look at this and we need to look at different ways of working, not in the sense that dressing up cuts as different ways of working, but there have to be ways that we can do things better and more efficiently and still provide a good service for people. I want to protect the vulnerable. I want to protect the old. I want to protect the people from the horrific uh, interviews that they're having to go through for disability assessments and anything I can do to stand against that I will do. Like, like you said in your, your opening state, in your question there are massive challenges. I think it was actually me that said the word hard choices in the last listings. I know you were there but um, I'm not going to get an argument about where the cuts are coming from. That's not why we're here. Um, you know, there, there was a million pound surplus, I think, in the budget this year, but there could be up to ten million pound less in the budget next year. We only get we only the council only gets its budget one year in advance, so it's very hard to say what we would do. But obviously, I think everyone in the panel will say that we obviously don't want less money. That we're obviously going to fight against austerity cuts and all that. But all I can say is that there are going to be very difficult choices to be made. But I've, I've laid my priority out in my leaflets against cutbacks to the hospital, against cutbacks to Stroon Lodge, getting the, the black part pitch, um, pitches fixed and things like that. And I, I meant those things. But to do that, there will be very hard choices that have to be made. And you know, you're know you going to have to work with all the people in the council to make those choices. Yes. Um let the, the council faced, as I said last Tuesday, the council faced um, 6.7 million cuts this year. And as I um, also said last week, I, I got it wrong, it's 1.2 million. The community charge raises actually 1.4 million. Um, I'm totally opposed to closure of Strone Lodge. As, as somebody's mentioned, it should be a centre of excellence rather than being closed. Um, I do believe that what we need to do is we need to lobby the government to, to try and give us extra funds for um, our services. We need to make it clear to them that we are in a completely different uh, geographical um, situation than most people. I'm probably repeating myself. If you go to Inverclyde, um, they've got two swimming pools, we've got seven. Um, you can't compare us. So we need to look at the finances of the council and then challenge the government to release and give us more funding. Um, I think the, the special islands needs allowance needs to. I know the council's been fighting for years, but if I if I was elected, along with other councillors from whatever party, we need to stand and fight to get more money. But we also need to um, oppose these cuts, especially to the hospital, which I've said, and to Stone Lodge. Um, and I'm not. I'm well aware of the fact that there will be hard, there will be difficult choices. But at the end of the day, there's got to be a fight before those choices to see where we can actually find extra funds. I know there's different ways of running services. Um, uh, there's services in different... ...into three. That's a totally open question, but you need, really need to look at that and how we can actually save money so that we can direct the money to um, the services that need it. Um, Education's taken a huge hit. Uh, they've all taken a huge hit, and, and it is difficult. But there is no doubt it's going to be tough. And going into the elections this time is it's not going to be easy. Um, but as I said, I'll fight my corner and I'll fight Denise Corner as much as I can and our Glen Buttes. I think uh, I've already said in my opening statement that I believe that the the sign of, uh, inequality. Has been is, is reprehensible for anybody to say otherwise. Um, that has lent, in, in my view, to where we are just now. The other thing is, and as I said last week, although it's been nice, um, council house, uh, sorry, your, your domestic rates not been increased in the last ten years. In retrospect, that's been a bit of a folly because if it had paid five, as I said last week. But every household had paid five pound a year, not a week as some people thought I was advocating, a year, ten pence a week more on every year. 
would have uh, plugged a, a huge gap in some of the funding without really you know, affecting everybody's budgets. 10p a week could have d d gone a big way to, to help that. What do we do now? We've just got to keep pressing the case for a fair settlement. As Jim has said, and as other people have said, Argyll and Butte is absolutely, completely and utterly different from some of the, the other councils. And I've worked for Inverclyde Council as a supply and relief teacher. And there, there's it's such a compact area that they can concentrate the resources, whereas we've got all the way from Campbellton to be, uh, up towards uh, the port of Appen in one direction, and from Helensburgh to Tyree in the other. We are the second biggest geographical area, and every education or care inspector report starts with the, the rural nature of Argyll and Butte. They recognise it. They've now got to start putting the money and say, we've got, there's, there's got to be a different formula to give us a fair settlement so we can do the things and have the services that you, the people, clearly demand. That's what my fight would be. Yeah, I, I think in relationship to the uh, council tax, it is true that over the 10 years it has cost the Scottish Government £50 million extra per year to pl fill that gap because of not putting the council tax up, which has rolled up over 10 years to £3.5 million, I think, thereabouts, or £500 million at the end. And when the SNP tell us that they are opposed to austerity, and clearly I don't have any brief for the Conservative Party, they not only passported on the cuts they got from Westminster, but they cut it even more by a further 11%. And when they say to you, vote for us and we'll form an administration with the independents and take things forwards, that's exactly what they did in 2012. If you recollect, Mike Bresling was elected as an SNP councillor. What happened to his membership of the SNP? He had to resign with 18, within 18 months because the SNP-led administration wanted to close Stroon Lodge and he was opposed to it. So, you know, that was the SNP administration. So, I think Einstein said if you do the same thing twice and expect a different result, you must be mad. So don't believe what the SNP are telling you when they did different the time before. Now, the other thing about austerity is what a lot of councils and councillors do. They manage down expectations, right? For example, if you are a person who's got special needs, you don't get those special needs recognised until they're assessed, right? So councils stop doing assessments because once there is an assessment, those special needs, they become an obligation on the council. Well, there's lots of things like that. There was a report in the paper this week about the Albany Hotel in John Street, opposite Morrison's. I know there was a report to the council in 2015 which said that the council could do it up and put a charge against the building. Guess what? It was on the private agenda. Guess what? The councillors there said, oh, if we did it there, we'd have to do it all over a garland. We'll open the floodgates. We'll have too much expense. we better kick it into touch. So what happens is that councillors manage down expectations. If you elect me, I'll manage them up. And if the council goes broke, I will lead a delegation for a judicial review to say, why has the council got all of these obligations but the money? Scottish... I don't think the SNP councillors will do that. We've got to push to maintain our rights. We've got to make sure that we get the money into the coffers. And the only way to do that is by getting people to pay more and getting the Scottish Government to actually raise taxes rather than dodging the column. Yes, um, you, can, you, can, you can call it what it is, you know, if it's austerity or, you know, it's less money from Westminster, whatever it is. The, the simple fact of the matter is that there's less money there and uh, whoever is elected is going to have to deal with that. Um, and, you know, it's, all I can say, I think the question was, you know, what, what if I was elected, what am I going to do? Am I going to oppose it or am I going to fight for, for, for more money? Yes, of course I'm going to fight for more money. 
my my interest is the noon uh, and, and and in this area, uh, and if and if that's what I'll be fighting for is is for that. And if that means yes, I want more money, then that's simply what I'll be asking for. Um, there is tough decisions, and um, you, you know the people that, that are elected are going to have to make them, and there's no getting away from it. It's, it's going to have to be done. But fighting for what is good for the noon is, is what I'm going to be doing. Well, first of all, I want to take issue with a few things that have been said so far. Um, last week at the Hustings in the Noon Grammar School, all but one candidate managed to maintain the Hustings in a positive way, uh, talking about what they would like to do for the community and how they are going to stand up for the people. Um, but again, this week we have seen an attempt to turn this into a party political playground, which I don't think many people are interested in. The only thing I'm going to say on that is that if... Uh, Mick Rice is opposed to austerity. Perhaps he can ask his colleagues in Westminster to stop abstaining on opportunities to block it. <laughs> My view on austerity is that we shouldn't be settling for it. Um, and whilst you know you can sit there and go, okay, so there's going to be less money, we can argue for more. I think we need to argue for this to stop. I think. Uh, the people throughout the United Kingdom are going to have an opportunity to change things on the 8th of June. But I think that is a, a discussion for the 8th of June. Right now, we're talking about how we uh, make positive change in our Galen Butte and in Dunoon. On that, there are, there are a lot of ways to do that. One of those is when it comes to making decisions. Um, you can design things in a way that the, you're elected by the people, but they still call the shots, they still make the decisions. And to do that, uh, when it comes to having a consultation on, on, on service choices, you, you don't make it in the deepest, darkest corners of a website that is difficult for everyone to, uh, to locate. But further on that, it is, it is too late for us to sit down and say, what, what services are we going to cut next? We can't do that anymore. The, the services in Dunoon, the services in Argyll and Butte can't take any further cuts. Uh, that is the bottom line. Uh, so what we need to look is where we're wasting money. The council is, uh, has a very strong record of wasting money, actually. If you uh, look at the simple fact of the amount of waste, now this was catastrophic amounts of money wasted on the Castle Tower fiasco when the community put in a very fair bid. <laughs> so I think you need to elect people who are going to fight against austerity. Uh, and I, I would think that myself and Audrey are both very viable candidates for that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, austerity is what it is. It's a lack of money. And I think I concurred last week as well. Hard choices are going to have to be made. There is no magic wand. And I agree wholeheartedly with Brian who said if we had increased council tax in gradual increments over the last five years, we might have had more money to play with. But there's no getting away with it. Hard choices are going to be made. I don't know where they're going to be, but somebody's going to be hurting. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I think I've heard a lot about Dunoon, but not a lot about Toward and uh, in Allen and other the villages, um, because a lot of the policies have been driven by towns and not looked at the villages and that interaction. So I'd like some more views on that. I think secondly, um, we've talked about Cal Tow uh, Castle Tower and all that kind of thing. My view is that councillors have not stepped up and have not taken an Argyll and Butte view. They put their heads down for their own area and they have not taken decisions, have watched very carefully the decisions that have been made and it's a few leaders leading us in the wrong direction in terms of councillors and many who have not actually up and taken decisions. They've had a lot of evidence presented to them that has not been paid attention to and not replied to or debated. So what would you do differently and how would you ensure that there's an Argyll and Butte strategic view as well as local views and yeah there's not much money left but we waste a lot of it and I can see an awful lot of ways that if you worked with communities 
really worked with communities that we could solve a lot of the problems. And I'm not hearing enough about how that will happen. Okay, um, I'm going to give everybody the opportunity again. There's such good questions. If you get fed up, just walk out. But um, I've got to. I'll start here, go that way, and then we'll start that way. One thing I've been made aware of is that with the fish farm being brought uh, into existence in the last couple of years, there's a concern about the road uh, that it's taking a bit of a pounding from the lorries that are going down. So that would be one issue that's got to be addressed uh, for the community. Um, because I live in Dunoon and I don't get down here very often, I probably am a wee bit you know, cut off to the needs. But as a councillor, I'd have to come down here a lot and listen and learn from the people that live in the rural communities. Um, there's no two ways about it. You know, your needs, although you may need the town, you will have individual needs that you need addressed. And if it's, you know, dog litter, which is a, an issue where I live, I don't know whether it's an issue with, with you. So I have my own view about that one, and I'm a responsible dog owner. It takes two labs out every night. I've got a Labrador I've got to watch, an old one, because he could clean the streets for you. Um, I'll, but I would need to know what you guys... I would be a listener and then a champion for you. But I do, I do, I'm, I'm aware of the, the issue of... The, um, the, the road, and it seems to be getting a bit of wear and tear because of the increased volume of traffic. That's just one issue that I am aware of. I'm sure you've got a million others. Thank you. Um, so I can the local area during uh, Tilbert and, and Ellen and up to Rostrad, and, and the issues have been um, talked about is pathways, issues with trees, issues with noise, issues with traffic and issues with people wanting to help the council but not being allowed to, which I find incredible. You know, at this time of austerity that gentleman asked earlier on, this is the time when people, we, we need to enable people to do for themselves because somewhere in our society someone's come up with the idea that uh, the council will do everything for you and I'm not saying that that's not the case, but the vulnerable and people that need to have things done, for them, they need to be a priority. But when people come forward and say they want to do things for the community and the council's trying to stop them, that you've got to find a way of making that happen. That's a simple thing. The question you answered about our Gale and Butte strategy, um, when I worked for the council, I had to work in five different towns, areas, and it took a while to get them all to subscribe to the fact that the leisure department was one department and you had to take care of the, the place that was the most, had the, needed the most investment rather than just spending little pockets of money. So that's the kind of attitude I'd be taking into the council that we need to take a, a broad look at how we're going to run the services and make sure that if there's something happening in one of the towns, that's then we need to go there. If you're a councillor for Argyll and Butte, that's what you honestly have to do. And that's what I would be doing. The other thing, that, um, just as a thing about saving money, I know that everybody was against the bin collections, but the thing about the bin collections is we, I think we're, and I don't mean people that need their bins uplifted more should have that if they're vulnerable people. But the other thing is, we are now recycling more. The government charges the council over a hundred pounds for every ton of rubbish. By recycling more, it's costing the council less money because they're not getting charged so much tonnage. There's the thing that's actually happened. People are not very happy about, but people are actually recycling more. And I know there's a lot of issues about that, but the answer to your question is, as an Argyll and Butte councillor, you have to take the interest of your town, but you are an Argyll and Butte councillor, and you have to take an overview of what's happening if you're talking about uh, disabled facilities and, and swimming pools or disabled access and buildings. If there's a town that needs more money spent, you have to be a councillor and you have to um, show your the metal and say, yes, we have to support that. That's where I'd be coming from. Yeah, you asked about the issues out here and I mean, not if whichever one is lucky enough, whichever three of us are lucky enough to be elected, we're going to have to make sure we come out here because the issues out here are different from the issues in town. So we're going to have to make sure we come out here, knock doors and ask people what's wrong. Like I said, I, 
I work just up the hill there and I've got a colleague in my other job that lives a bit further out. And um, I hear some people complain about their net connection and it's not very good, but then other people tell me it's great. So I know some people must be struggling, but then other people apparently got better connection than I do. So I would find out who, who, where it's actually bad. Um, you, you talked about how councillors aren't stepping up and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I said last week that for far too long this council has been officer led. It's been led by people that, you know, we haven't voted for and it's, you know, whoever gets elected they need to step up because they're going to be your representatives. They need to be, they should be the ones that are held accountable and they need to be leading and making the decisions, not the officers who haven't been voted in. Yes, yeah, so on that particular point, I, I agree strongly with, with what's been said. Um, the, the elected people are the people who should be making the strategic decisions. And one thing we all have to agree here today is whichever three of us get elected, whatever flavour we are, we will stand together to make sure that this is a member-led council rather than an officer-led council. They're there to advise. They're not there to make strategy. That's our job. And I certainly would hopefully be strong in, in trying to maintain that. In terms of, of local things and what are happening, um, somebody had said, you know, that it was the thought is the council does everything. And yeah, things have to change. A good example is public toilets. Um, there's a lot of argument goes on about public toilets. There are the first one that I saw that was run by a community was on Mull out at Calgary Bay. And it was the loveliest wee place and it had some flowers and it had some, you know, it, everything was just nice about it. The same thing is true at Ardentini. So there are small projects like that that locals want to take on. And up until now, they've been hindered. They've be, it's, it's been a nightmare to try and get things done. Uh, someone I was speaking to was uh, trying to get the license for the putting at the Queen's Hall to run that. And the, the, hoops they have had to jump through and the big, big walls that have been put in their way have been ridiculous. That's a small business wanting to do something nice locally. We need to change that culture of trying to put uh, walls in the way of local people doing things. Um, we need to listen. One of the things as a councillor, um, it is very easy to say, come and see me. Uh, email me, phone me. Actually, I would like to get out and talk to people before it gets to the point where they have to contact me about an issue. If I am elected, I will listen. I will come to Anel and I will come to Toward. Recently, I drove all the way down to Inverhoolan, so I know what the road's like. Um, but I did that just to have a look because I hadn't been down that way for a long time. And Again, it's a very beautiful place, but there must be issues with transport and stuff, which I would like to find out more about, and I would certainly represent that end as well as this end. Thank you. Right, I'm conscious that uh, John has been left to the last. He's not going to be left to the last. We'll start with you, John, and work towards... Thank you. Once again... If I'm fortunate to get in this time, I will make it a point, and it goes without saying, I'll make it a point to regularly attend these meetings down here so that you're getting first-hand the problems that arise down here. I'll be honest with you, I don't know as many of the problems that you're facing down here and what your wish list is, but I can assure you that if I'm one of the fortunate ones to get in here, I'll be here, and I'll be hearing your issues and they're aired first hand at your community council meetings. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say you've been one of the last people to speak. A lot of a lot of what I would I would say has been said, but to, to, to add a few things, and, and from my experience um, uh, in the workplace, I, I've, uh, I've gained a lot of knowledge of the, of the issues that are more specific to an and Tower than they are to Dunoon, but I, I think there's a, a lot of places where issues are shared. Um, I, th I think, uh, as Ross was talking about earlier, uh, connectivity is a far bigger issue down here than it is in the centre of Dunoon. And actually, having looked at things before, if you, if you look at where super fast connections are, the, uh, the road that leads down from Ellen Village 
to uh, Tower has about 200 black spots on it where there's three or four houses losing out and everyone else around them hasn't. So I think there's, there's things like this that, that we need to work on. Um, and actually with uh, the Scottish Government giving a commitment for uh, everyone in, in Scotland to have uh, super fast broadband by 2020, it going to be a duty as a, a councillor to be raising these uh, areas of issue with them. I think uh, in my, my last, last answer, I, I, I hit on a, a, a few of the, the topics, namely Castle Tower. Um, and, you know, I, I think unfortunately that was uh, one of the, the reasons that Tower became uh, more of a, a nationally, nationally known place in the past few years was for all the wrong reasons. Um, uh, but fortunately, in, in regards to uh, someone standing up, whilst you're right that those in the power who could have made a difference did not stand up. Uh, one of the people who did stand up was actually the local MSP who made sure that there is now a clause in the uh, Community Empowerment Act, which means that, that can never happen again. And I think whilst, unfortunately, um, the, as there was not the people there to fix that issue, uh, that is at least something that, that myself and SMP colleagues can be proud of, um, that we've seen an issue that we were unable to to change, no matter how much we tried, um, it won't happen again. Uh, I think you know a lot of other people have been talking about attending meetings down here, and that is one of the benefits of this board. We have two separate community councils uh, who cover two separate areas, um, and I, I think it's, it's not just a good thing. I think it's an absolute responsibility of whichever three uh, are elected here to meet with that community council at every meeting, if possible. Um, but to be very heavily engaged with all communities in the Dunan Ward uh, to make sure that all issues for all communities are taken forward and worked on. Yeah, uh, just roughly what everyone else has, has basically said. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, for too long the, the, the councillors um, in Argyll and Butte um, I don't think have been as forceful standing up for, for local issues and, uh, um, you know, working for the, the, the community. Um, at the end of the day, the, the, the three people who are going to be elected um, are, are working for, for you guys and you know they have to get out, they have to make themselves available to you guys to find out what the issues are and what it is you want us to do um, because at the end of the day that's, that's why we're, we're elected to, to work for you. Um, I know that uh, as you say, our areas all have different needs and, 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 and different issues. Um, I know that quite personally because I, I work already in the, the, a, a, a service issue or a service provider uh, with the local buses um, all over. So I do know and I hear lots of issues and you know down this end of the area, area and, and even as far out as Port of Addy and, and, and Rossi as well. So I do know that there's, there's the various issues elsewhere um, that are different from you know what we see in the town every day um, and, and basically it's just we have to if we're elected get out speak to people make ourselves available and, and find out what the issues are and then take that back and work as hard as we can for for you guys thank you <clears throat> some of the wards in our garland butte are much better named than this one for example there's oban north and lawn and there's oban south in the isles and why did they not call this ward Danoon in Ellen and Towered? Because they could have done. Although, in fact, of course, that would be a bit of a misnomer as well, because it's not even properly Danoon, because virtually half of Danoon is in the Cowell Ward. The boundaries down Arden Slate Road and then along to Dalling Road. So, you know, you've got a good chunk of Danoon, I think. Now, it does seem to me in terms of strategic notions, and here, wait for it. <coughs> I'm going to be nice to the SNP, so you know, please listen. I believe in the principle of subsidiarity, which is an old EU term, which basically means that decisions should be taken as close to the people as possible. And therefore, I would want to see more resources at an area committee level and more decisions made at an area committee level that affect the people in that area. And guess what? They've got the SNP manifesto. So I'm prepared to show that I work with other parties. I'm prepared to work with the SNP on that issue. But let me say this. I would want them to work with me on the harbour issue because the harbour Jews at Danoon give a subsidy of a quarter of a million pounds a year to the Bath 
and they're going to charge millions of pounds if you have a decent vehicle passenger ferry call in there because they're trying to milk the system by charging a new ferry operator that amount of money. And of course, the truth is, they won't do it, so we won't have it. So I would want them to work with me to actually have reasonable harbour charges at Danoon rather than forcing away the potential of a decent ferry service. So there you go. That's what I would do. Okay, questions? Yes, sir. And before you ask the question, and we're starting with Audrey at the bottom. have to get money from somewhere, don't we? And yes, is the answer to your question. Yes, I mean, like like what you just said, you'll probably get a quite similar answer from everyone. Uh, we'd have to get money from somewhere. There's obviously just been a rise and then the national rise and then the council voted as well. I would like to see the people with the broader shoulders pay a little bit more because, like I just said, we do need to get money from somewhere. But to, to Brian's point, if it had been risen slowly over the years, that would have been quite helpful. The unfortunate thing is we are playing catch-up, and we should have done it over a period of time, which is quite sad, really. And then we're faced with the position we've got, the austerity we have at the moment. Um, but the, the bottom line is, to answer your question, is if we are responsible for the budget and we feel that we can save services and save people's jobs, and it means putting the community charge up half a percent or whatever it may be, then we have to do it. I hope I've already answered the bulk of your question, but um, I'm going to point out that Reform Scotland, as I said last week, have, have actually made a recommendation that councillors should actually set the domestic and non-domestic rates, and that makes them accountable to the, the people that, that elect them. Uh, now, this was part of the, the rollout of the of the devolved minist you know, the, the principles of devolution, that this wouldn't be uh, kept centrally, and we're 10 years, you know, 10 years plus down the line, and that kind of thing hasn't come towards. I was aware of the, the business rates, sorry, non-domestic uh, council tax was set centrally. I was totally gobsmacked to find out that domestic rates are as well. But that would explain, you know, the, the freeze over the last 10 years or so. So I think, you know, those with a, uh, with a slightly broader shoulders, and that includes myself, Yes, uh, we should pay a little bit more to maintain the services for the most vulnerable in our communities and to provide the services which everybody here clearly needs. Yeah, um, the non-domestic rate, the business rate, is, is set centrally and it basically means that if a council gets involved in regeneration activities, improving the economy and therefore you get an increased value in, in businesses, the increase doesn't go to the council, it goes to the government and then they redistribute it on a per head population basis. So, you know, we don't get it back. So that does need to change. I also think it needs to be made clear what has happened about the council tax freeze. Because whilst it is true that councils had the power to put the council tax up in the last 10 years, they were told by the Scottish government that if they did, the Scottish Government would claw it back through reducing the grant they got from them. So what did councils do? They actually 
actually went along with the council tax freeze because they had no alternative, because they weren't going to get any more if they did put the council tax up. So that's got to be opened up. And we've got to get the Scottish Government on board to allow us to do it. Now, I'm in favour, not simply of putting up the council tax, but by I'm actually in favour of consulting with the people. And I'm very keen on the notion of citizen juries and maybe even sort of local referenda on what people think would be a reasonable amount to put it up and what that would equate to in terms of the protection of services. Because I think the more people that you can engage in that process, the better, rather than somebody from on high is always making the decision for you. So that's what I'm in favour of doing. Personally, I'm in favour of putting up the council tax, but I'd want people to understand what it means and to involve them in the process before the final decision is made. Simple answer, yes. Uh, I think we need a bit more uh, to, to, to get the services that, that, that we need. Um, yes, I, I, simple answer, definitely. Should, should be paying a bit more. Well, you know, I uh, obviously represent the political party who put the, the freeze on council tax 10 years ago. Um, what I would say is in, in 2007, uh, that political party, the SNP, stood on a manifesto commitment of freezing the council tax. They were elected to government in 2011. They stood on a manifesto commitment of maintaining that freeze. They were elected to government. However, in 2016, they stood on a manifesto commitment of changing that and of introducing a way in which councils could raise the higher bands of taxes by a few percent, and they were elected to government. Uh, and so that is now policy. That is, uh, that, that is now something that was within the council's ability to do, and that's something that I'll support. Thank you. I, again, I am quite happy that council tax goes up in regular increments, but what I would like to see is, I know it goes into the coffers of central government, I would like to see it ring fence to be spent in the local area, which it doesn't at this moment in time. It goes into the coffers in central government and we don't get it back. Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, often the shorter questions get great answers. So, yes, sir, please. Um, thank you. Take that one. I'll take it. I'm with you, Ben. Well, it's strange because I have a bit of knowledge about this because uh, in the 1980s there used to be a trade union representative on the Education Authority until until Thatcher, no, a general trade union uh, representative, until Thatcher changed it. There used to be trade union reps on technical college boards and all this stuff. And she changed the rules, but it just so happens that I became the trade union rep on Birmingham City Council, on the Education Authority, before she changed the rules. And I went along, and it was the first time I'd been exposed to a council. And I met councillors for the first time. And after I'd been to a few meetings, it suddenly dawned on me that they weren't all that good. And that, maybe, I could have a go and, and do something good as well. And that's how I got interested 
in being a councillor all those years ago. So I would be in favour of opening up council meetings and I'd be in favour of having teacher reps but, and I'd be in favour of having church reps. Let's give them something useful to do, for goodness sake, but not giving them a vote and an advisory capacity. And I'd want to see if there's teacher pupil reps attending as well so that we get their input. So, you know, I would want to open council meetings and try and have more reps there who we could listen to, but you can't give them a vote because you have to be elected properly by the people to have a vote. That's my view. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for me, uh, just on a common sense basis, that there, there shouldn't be anyone making any decisions that isn't accountable to the public and therefore elected by the public. But I think one of the, the, the best ways that we could start to improve democracy in local government and in our Gale and Butte is uh, by making all decisions that are, are made at council level entirely public. Uh, by that, there are already facilities in the council that mean council meetings could be live streamed. Uh, in the way that Hollywood debates are and Westminster debates are. However, that's not something that, that has been used up until this point. So I'd like to see that. I would like to you know, see, uh, as I mentioned earlier on in the evening, uh, all business by the council being done in public so that everyone who is elected is then entirely accountable. Decisions are not entirely made um, by uh, officers but also by uh, councillors because the decisions need to uh, have the input of those who they're going to affect. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would ask uh, that those who want to see decision-making brought back to them uh, consider giving me one of your voter preferences next week. Uh, right, we'll leave that. Uh, let's have somebody over there. Right at the back, in the corner, please. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's just not can I, can I just, can I just ask um, each candidate, um, and how will they reassure um, communities in South Cowell um, that lessons have been learned within the council in terms of community empowerment? Could you restate the question and? Loudly, please. I can address everybody, but if you're asking questions, this goes about to speak up because some people might struggle to clean, but I'll read your stuff. So.
was like I was saying, we need to be able to engage the parts in the community for uh, hopefully you know, we'll do that. What we can do to reassure you is that I, I've said in my leaflet, I said the last debate that I said the question earlier, that we need to get out and actually listen to people and what they actually want, not just not wait for you to come to tell us, you know, to go out and what goes here, because needs here are different. In all spaces, we need to do that in a reward and all over we like are elected. And uh, yeah, you, you know better, so we need to actually listen to you. And if I'm elected, you you, you will be the first priority people that have elected me. So that I, I would do. Yeah, as you said, the actual take care of that kind of thing not happen again. But the other issue I have with it all is um, the fact that. Uh, the council's got a communications department, and what I find astounding, and, I, and I, again, I'll admit I don't know enough about the whole thing because this of information came from here, there, behind closed doors, and everything. But to me, the whole problem was that the information there was the tra there needed to be complete transparency, and then the information needed to come out so that the community knew immediately what was happening. And also, communication is a big issue for me from the council because. People find something out about two months later and they maybe um, get the wrong facts. It's important, if, if I'm elected in the council, I'm going to, my, one of my main aims is to make sure that people know what's actually happening, even if it's something that they don't particularly like and that the facts are there. For example, as I said at the meeting last week, people don't say, I want to see what decisions are made today. Nobody does that. But what should happen is when these decisions are made, it should be out there in the public domain saying this is what this was decided by the people elected at the area committee. And what happens with the area committee is they make recommendations which go to the council. So you then know that the people in your area are putting forward what they feel the council makes that decision. There's a real lack of communication and that causes a lot of problems for me in, in this instance. I don't know enough about the ins and outs of the whole case. I've looked at it in the paper, I've looked at it online, but to me there needs to be more accurate information, there needs to be a steady flow of information to the public, face to face if it has to be, rather than uh, bits of paper and emails, that to me just causes problems. If you're open and honest with the people, they'll respect that, whether they agree with the decision or not. I agree with Jim. Uh, I had no idea, what, you know, you know, the the truth uh, behind what happened at Castle Tower because I think it was a there was a code of silence. Um, some people said that it, you know they were going to get hammered by Audit Scotland because they were selling an asset that was valued much more. That's totally immaterial. The the the, the everything that should have been involved involving the community here. To, to, so that the, the information was a two-way process and people understood, they might not like a, a, a decision, but they, they should have been fully informed at all times about what was going on. And that's what needs to change. It needs to have this open door policy. It needs to be accountable and it needs to be heard. You know, the, the, you know, any decisions that are made on your behalf that you should be aware of them, not having to kind of pick them up piecemeal from here or there or, or did you hear this happen from a, some whispers that you've heard it should be up, open and in front for everybody to hear yeah, Sometimes elected politicians make decisions that I can't understand I mean it's almost as if they've got a death wish I mean I know that Mike Russell has never really supported a proper town centre ferry service vehicle passenger He's never done that. And obviously, Dick Walsh, as leader of the council, didn't support the community buyout of Castle Towered. And at the same time, I understand that the community bid was for £850,000. And by the time Castle Towered was sold to the private sector, when they deducted the ongoing maintenance cost, the council only received half a million pounds for it. So how could you snub your own community and lose the council £350,000? It is just imponderable why that occurred. 
But I am in favour, and again, I want to reach out to my colleagues in the SNP because I'm in favour of giving greater power to community councils. Because I know we have a lively community council in South Cowell. Why is it that they can't manage any local services or have a budget, or proper budget? Because what happens is you have development trusts come along and they get community money, but community councils are barred from having any significant funds except for their maintenance, you know, or hiring of all. Why is it not the case that we discuss with the community councils what they need at a local level? Can we devolve a budget to them? Now, the truth is we might have to change the law to enable that to happen, but it's in the gift of the Scottish Government because it's a devolved issue. Sorry. Yes, um, the, the thing with the candidates here tonight, none of us were involved in any of these, these, these decisions that's, that's, that's went in the past and, and uh, you know, we can't really say what definitely happened and what didn't happen. Um, yes, if there was, um, if there was mistakes made, um, you know, we won't know. However, in my own job that I do as, as a manager, you know, if there's mistakes made, um, what you do is you, you look at what went wrong, you learn lessons from it and you move on. Uh, and, and, and ensure it doesn't happen again. And if that means the community wasn't listened to in any of these decisions, then that's a mistake that needs to be rectified. Um, and, you know, if, if I was elected, you know, to answer your, your question, Ali, is, you know, I would learn lessons from anything that, that happened in the past and, and try and make sure they didn't happen again. Well, I, I won't speak on this for too long because obviously I've, uh, I've gone into community impairment a few times already this evening. But uh, first of all, I would say, has the lesson uh, been learned by the current administration? I wouldn't say so, no. Absolutely not. Uh, and unfortunately, the one candidate who was involved in that decision making isn't here tonight and wasn't there last week, so can't answer your questions on these. Um, how do we ensure the community that uh, lessons will be learned? Well, I think what we need to do is we need to elect new people. We need new people in the council. Uh, we need people with different ideas. And uh, we need people who are committed uh, to community empowerment. And I believe I'm one of those candidates. <coughs> Thank you. Community empowerment, what can we do to ensure the protection of our communities? We've got to come along to meetings like this, find out what your issues are, and take them up to our guilt head. The only, what really annoys me is they're up there, they're entrenched up there, they're on colossal salaries, and just to digress if I can, Chair, it absolutely astounded me the money that our local authority officers are getting for running this election. I think it's scandalous. They're getting bonuses of six figures. And I don't know, sorry that I'm deviating from, but we need to come here, listen to what your problems are, and make sure that you're happy that we are representing you up in Lucky Open. Questions, please? Yes, please. Right over the corner. That one's up. Um, I myself like to read the leaflets that are delivered to our home, and most of them mention Indie Ref 2. Even I know that it's not that Indie Ref 2 has nothing to do with the council elections. So why is it necessary to mention Indie Ref 2? I'm on again. Good question. And it's good that it's coming from one of the younger members of our audience. Um, I think I can quite safely say I didn't mention Indie F2 in my leaflet. And you're nodding. I'm delighted to see you're nodding. Um, as I said in my leaflet, and as I said when I was speaking earlier on, I don't wish in any way to be a spokesman for any party political any political party in any way. So I fully agree with your comments. Thank you. Well, first of all, to declare an interest, that was my 11-year-old sister that has just asked that question. And I, <laughs> however, I can tell you, 
I can tell you straight away I was entirely unaware the question was coming and would have appreciated the brief. Um, however, uh, I, I can say that uh, Audrey and I's leaflets are here and there isn't one reference to it. Um, there is a leaflet that references it 21 times. Um, there is a leaflet that mentions Nicola Sturgeon nine times. There is a leaflet that uh, doesn't mention their local candidate or local policies, but it's not mine. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. It, uh, it, it doesn't uh, have a, a particular effect on, on you know, whether we, we are elected. Um, well, I don't believe it, it, it should do. Um, but I think... Um, a lot of the big parties do mention it simply because it is an issue in Scotland and it's, and it's one that's not, it's not going to go away for a long time. Um, I have my personal views on it and, and uh, you know, personally I do think it, it may it, and it could do ha have a, an effect at, at a, a community level. Um, but that's you know, not for us to decide tonight. Um, and uh, I can only say it's mentioned in, in uh, some um, election addresses, and that's simply because it is an issue in Scotland, and, and it's on it's on everyone's mind. There's no getting away from that. Uh, I don't mention IndyRef2 in my leaflet. I'd like personally to give you one, so that you can read it and tell your brother what to do. <laughs> And I didn't mention it at all because this is about local issues, about the, how we empower you. And it might be, it's going to come up in the next couple of years, but that's when Indir F2 should be involved. I did notice one of the main political parties he bangs on about it all the time. But then there's a vested interest there to keep the union. I didn't mention it in mine because um, I agree that we have enough issues locally to deal with. We'll have our hands full. If I'm elected, we'll have our hands full. And the local issues are what this is all about. It was nothing to do with NDRF2. Uh, I've sent out three different leaflets. I did definitely mention it in one, but... Um, <laughs> I did, I, did, I, did, I did start by saying, no, that this is a local election and this shouldn't really be in here. But just so you do know, because people do have a right to know what you think about this kind of thing, just in case. But I did start by saying this shouldn't really matter in this election. But people do have a right to know. I think if you do stand for political party, maybe this is a difference. They do have a right to, to know what you think about this. But I did put it in one of my three leaflets. Thank you. Uh, you've already seen my leaflet with cares. Uh, the, just what everybody said, this is about local authority, this is about what happens in Colmore. But I would like to thank Ms Davidson for the number of times she mentioned the SNP and independence in her leaflet. All publicity is good. <laughs> I don't I mentioned SNP though, so no. <laughs> Okay, questions. I can see a hand right at the back there, please. <laughs> Making you work. Hold on. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to keep the mic over here there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I'm really grateful and I've uh, taken take my hat off to the people that have mentioned and acknowledged the issues, the long-term issues in the council in terms of the, the leadership or lack of and also the issues of it being, for want of a better word, an old man's club. Um, and also it's nice to see that it's been acknowledged about the officers as well that are working in the council. What are you guys going to do to sort the officers out? That's what I'd like to know. Because see, there's, a, there's, a nice new wave, there's a nice new wave of councillors coming in, hopefully, which is desperately needed. But it's there's a corrupt little bunch that need to get gone. What are you going to do? Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Um, well, what we will not be doing is walking in and sacking people because the only person that can sack people is the chief executive. Um, I don't know most of these people personally. 
but I would want to find out more. And I'm interested in what the gentleman over here said, that he doesn't think we would be banging on a closed door in terms of trying to make sure that those people who have been obstructive, to put it nicely, um, that they are not allowed to continue to do that. That will be for the procedures that happen within the council. And until we are elected, um, I don't know what some of them are, but certainly it is on the radar. It is something that we have to watch because we do have to be the ones who are stepping up and saying, you know what, this is not okay. You're here to advise us. You're not here to tell us what to do. Because if we all agree that we will not be told what to do by officers, then the, it, it will work. Because the difficulty is that some people have been banging their heads off the walls. Mike Breslin has worked incredibly hard and has been banging his head off the wall because there's no consensus around this. And I think first thing we need to do is build a consensus that if things have happened that are wrong, that we will stand up to it, we will root it out and we will not let it continue. Yeah, like, like Audrey said, it has been really encouraging over the two hustings and actually the one in, in Cowell as well to see the people that are standing saying that they're going to end this, you know, they are going to stand up and lead. And I think there has been a general consensus with, well, there's only eight here tonight, but all six of the kill candidates were there that they are, no matter who they are, independent political party, they're going to put those differences aside. And I think everyone generally means it, that they are going to stand up and lead, because that's really, like you're saying, is the only way to really take take control. Like what it says, till we get in there and assess it, you can't really make any promises, but if if I am elected, then I'm getting elected to help lead the council, not to follow someone that you haven't voted for. Yes, it's um, this is straightforward to me. At the end of the day, the people are saying what they want, and we have to make sure when the full council is elected that one of the things they have to do right away is say that we will deal with this, these issues whereby people are not stepping up to the plate. And there are, as Audrey touched on, there are po uh, procedures and policies and stuff like that they can be followed and you can hold people can be held uh, to account about what they're actually doing what their role is and what they're actually doing so the full council has to be strong and make sure that they get what the people want and if that means bringing people forward and saying this is what you're meant to do this is what you've been doing then they can be called to account the process is there although the the councillors can't get involved in the actual process they can enact the process through the chief executive and I'm pretty sure that's the way it works. So that would have to, someone that's, um, they would have to be held accountable for the decisions and the actions they make. I'm not, the, like Audrey says, I'm not quite sure about the processes involved, but equally well, um, I, I got buttonholed on, on Sunday when I was out uh, or sorry, last night when I was out in, uh, in the campaign and uh, uh, I won't mention what service it came from but it was uh, basically, uh, and are you going to sort out these bullies? And she wasn't talking about elected members, she was talking about officers of the council. Um, if, well, well, as I say, I, I have to, you know, I'm looking at what's happened more recently in a in the, in the well-publicised education report from HMIE, and I've, I've looked at it, I've read the thing through and through, and somewhere along the line, I've read the minutes of that council meeting, uh, where the you know the, the Towsy one that the, you had a couple of weeks ago, and where s several councillors tried to adopt a less adversarial approach and work with Education Scotland. Um, but we saw what happened, that this complaint will be, you know, carry on. Now, I know at the, the, uh, the Cowell Hustings, one of the councillors put his hand up and says, because we made a complaint, you know, that's, you know, where we're going to have to carry that one. Um, it was quite driven by the officers. And although they may have a grudge, they've had plenty of opportunities uh, post and prior, and they're making certain uh, allegations about a lack of timing and a lack of notice. I think the, the head teacher's letter, uh, the anonymous head teacher from another 
sent his letter to the local paper last week, said it all. If, if we in the schools for the last 40 years have been, a, a, been told to be in a state of perpetual preparedness <laughs> for an HMI inspection and to get three, nearly three months notice, goodness sake, what, how long do you need? Um, that you know, some of the you know, I, I read the you know the actual report and the you know the, what was said, and the, certain phrases appear in all the six quality indicators. I can understand the frustrations, but the bottom line was that they have pressurised the elected representatives to make a decision to become more adversarial. That's clearly got to stop because they're not the ones that are elected to make the decisions. So if you're asking me what I would be doing in this particular instance, I'd be trying to get in and uh, smooth the waters and start to work constructively to move forward. Yes, we will probably have to, to you know, say to certain officers, this is what is expected of you in your job description. It's not, bullying in the workplace is totally and utterly unacceptable. And, and I'm saying that as a, when I did a year's debut in the, the grammar school all those years ago, what was the remit that Joe Rhodes gave me to do? Anti-bullying. Yeah, uh, as a trade unionist, I'm not in favour of witch hunts or denying even senior officers their rights as employees. And I'd want to ensure that due process is used and that there is proper evidence rather than we proceed on the basis of rumour. But I also believe this, having seen it in practice. Officers write reports to committees, and quite often they are clever enough to provide one, two or three different options. And guess what? They write the report so the option they want is inevitably the one that you're likely to support because they've written the report in that way. And then, if you have the temerity to say, well, I don't like your recommendation, I'm going to go for something different, do you know what they say? They say, well, oh, I'd be very careful there, councillor. And you say, why is that then? Because you could be personally liable for not accepting the officer's recommendation. It's on your own head if you go against our recommendation. And if things go wrong, you will be surcharged. That's what they say. I've heard them. Now, you have to be a pretty strong counsellor not to bend over and do as you're told, you know, when that is, is put forward. And, of course, it's all too easy to go along, get your allowances, take up the issues about the drop curbs and the bins not being emptied, and not tackle the officers properly at all. Because at the end of the day, you've got to do a lot of research and get a lot of information to be able to stand your ground against these people. And that's what we need to do. New ideas and enthusiasm is great, but you need some experience there to tackle these people and let them know, not that you're nasty, but that you, as an elected member, deserve respect because that's the only way to train them. Yeah, like uh, has already been said, um, it, it, it can't continue. I, I don't know what the processes are. Um, you know, I haven't got any experience in that. Um, but it, it can't continue to be officer-led. officer, officer -led. It, it, it just can't, can't uh, continue that way. And uh, the people that are elected have to be able to, to, to deal with it. Um, and uh, it is something we're going to have to face if elected, um, and we, we just need to be up to the job and stop it. You know, for the, for the good of everyone, it has to stop. So um, I would make sure that uh, I, I have to stand up to them. You know, I, I might not be. Um, you know, I have to learn to be strong to do it. It's as simple as that. It's the only way to succeed if I want to to, to get elected. Uh, you know. I think people are, are right when they say there can be uh, no witch hunt as such. Um, what, what I would say is when, when a report like the education report that we've seen comes out, then someone has to be responsible. Uh, we, we have to get to the bottom of these things, and there has to be some sort of inquiry into what's gone wrong and whose fault that is. Um, but 
the bottom line is these officers are going to be in post. If officers leave their position, they're going to be replaced by someone else. So you're always going to have to be strong um, and take them as solely advisory and not as uh, the be-all and end-all. Uh, so I think, you know, as a councillor, um, in or out of uh, administration, I would be maintaining a strong position with officers, uh, you know, listening to what they have to say, but then working hard to find out whether that is actually what is right. Um, and I think it's as simple as that. You have to be hard working. I think for too long we've had an awful lot of councillors in Argyll and Butte who like easy coasting. They like an easy job. They don't want to work for their money and they don't want to work for their communities. Um, so I am prepared to get in there and, and work hard to find out uh, the bottom of every issue um, and make decisions with advice to one side. I think the, the problem that we face here is, I know the, the officers up there are entrenched and um, I don't want to use certain words, but it, it might be easier attacking the Kremlin than attacking what's going on up at Komori. What we have, what we have, the problem is there are five major towns in this council and we don't know what agendas that these five different towns have with the, the officers up at Komori. So we need to get entrenched ourselves. I think it's easy to see that there's consensus around this table. If we get together and go up there with a united front, perhaps we can start making inroads in what's going wrong at Komori. Thank you. Now, uh, time's running against us. We're going to have maybe one or two more. So uh, remember, concentrate on local issues, please. So who? Yes, please. Thank you. It's more an observation than a question. To whoever's elected, when you go in to stop these officers that some very well-established, long-serving councillors. <laughs> so when you go in there to stop them out, just remember, you're not just taking on the officer, you're taking on some very powerful councillors. <clears throat> candidates have spoken tonight about accountability and you all spoke about it last week too. Um, we've had lots of independent councillors before in this ward uh, and they've often sold their independence to us as a positive thing, <clears throat> that they're not, they don't have to toe any party line in particular. But once elected, that lack of accountability has been palpable, Castle Towered, etc. Can I ask the candidates, particularly the independent ones, how they intend to enable the electorate to hold them to account, not in five years' time, but during their time as a councillor. Okay, I mean, that was specifically not entirely about uh, independent councillors, but we'll give the independent councillors the opportunity to go on this, I think. Um, I think it's going to be, I mentioned earlier, one of the communication who has a I see it all the time. You don't communicate and people just think of what is actually happening. And I think that's a huge problem. So for people to hold me accountable, um, obviously I'll be doing regular surgeries. But I think we need to think out the box and have a better communication with the electorate. If things are happening, make sure they know what's actually going on. Um, I think... Um, if I'm elected, that's what my plan will be, is that all the people and the world will know what's actually happened. If decisions are made, I want to make sure they find out the decisions as soon as possible. And, you know, whether they're, what they want, what they, um, it may be some of the hard decisions we were talking about earlier on, but to let the public know what's really going on at the time, not two months later. This is what caused a lot of problems in the council. They don't, they're not telling folk what's going on. So people are thinking up for themselves. 
Um, so as far as I'm concerned, that would work. Being an independent councillor, there is, at the moment, there's a, um, the, the council, the administration that's running at the moment has, and you have to give credit where credit's due. Right? You can't take credit for somebody else's work, but the bottom line is, the current administration has got the revamped Queen's Hall, you've got a new Green Clutha, a new school at Kern, a refurbished Hill Foot Street, an extension at Sandbank, so, and there is money coming into the town. So, you, I know we've heard a lot of negative comments tonight about everybody, but somewhere along the line, someone has done some work to get things done in the town, but they're still not being good at telling you it's happening. All of a sudden, you're driving into town and you see walls getting knocked down. Nobody really knows what's going on. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a huge issue for me, is to keep the people who you are working for because they're saying to you, you need to go up there and you need to make sure things happen for us. And that's the, the way I'll be playing it. That's as an independent councillor, if I'm elected, is I will make sure that people know what is going on. I think I would, I would agree with Jim saying, uh, we are accountable to you on a you know on a regular basis. We, we've got to think of a better way of getting people the communication to you. But you know, no, as Jim says, not two months later. Um, goodness sake, you know, there's such a thing as, say, Facebook. You know, you could easily go into Facebook or Twitter. You know, are Gail and Butte have a Twitter account? Why are they not putting on, a, this is where you can get the council minutes, and then you go online and do it? I know online isn't for everybody, but it's pretty instant. And then a regular surgery just after it, you guys see a report. You see minutes, decisions made, you come back to us and feed back what the answer is. You know, it's not rocket science. It's about the two-way communication that's got to be there so we know your needs and you can then reflect and tell us how you agreed with what we were doing. And if you don't agree with us, you know, you, you tell us. You tell us and then we can try and, you know, work. Is it? We're your representatives, not ours. John, would you like to go on? I'll bring you. Just as Brian and Jim were saying there, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, I'm committed to having regular uh, surgeries. I'm going to set up an email address and I'm going to have a dedicated phone number. That I'm going to be accountable because you, can, you will be able to talk to me almost 24-7. And I don't know how else I can be more accountable. Um, <laughs> Okay. Would anybody like to pick up on that, gentlemen? Would you like to? As far as the council is concerned, if, you, if, if the local people want a decision made, I'll be held personally accountable for the decision going in their, what they want. But the bottom line is, um, that's the way the business is. If you're elected as a councillor, you have to be accountable to local people. And the bottom line is, the next time round, if you're not, you've not done what they've wanted you to do, you're, you'll not be there. It's as simple as that. And that's what you're trying to get at, isn't it? Yeah. Your yes. Well, you'll, be, you'll hold me personally accountable if something goes against what you're asking for. You'll, you'll either email me or tell me that you're not happy about it. And, when you have, and again, that's a part of the process of listening to the people that you, they've put you there. I think you have to... It's a, there's a two-way street here. You know, you're going to go up there saying, the people in my ward are saying they want this. This is what I'm being told they want in this area. And the other thing is you're going to have another two councillors. So I would imagine that the personal accountability would go to the independent councillor, obviously, as you say. Well, the other two, they've really got to get their heads together and say, right, the people in our ward are saying this. See, when we go there, we've got to make it clear that our stance 
as Audrey had touched earlier on, is our stance is this is what the people want and this is what we'll be carrying forward. Um, yeah, everybody's going to get a chance to speak because we're wrapping up. This is the last question all about Thank you. I, th um, I think one of the difficulties is, is a five-year term for councillors. I, one of the things that um, that shocked me when the Castle Tower, sorry to keep going on about this, but I was involved at the time, the Castle Tower thing was that there was no accountability in terms of, I did not realise that there was no way of tabling a motion of no confidence in a council by the people who elected them. I, I, I assumed that that mechanism would exist, and it didn't. Uh, on a personal level, I'm obviously standing as a representative of a party, but my personal accountability will be to you. There are, um, there have been decisions made before. Someone alluded earlier on to, to when the SNP took the administration last time, and there was an issue with the cat with uh, Strewn Lodge. We have worked very hard together already, those of us who are standing, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. That I can assure you, if people want to talk about that, there's nobody more upset about that than us. We want to make sure that can and doesn't happen again. And we will personally be accountable to all of you. Yeah, I agree with what everyone said already, but you, know, you said about personal accountability. Um, um, if you don't be holding yourself to account, I, I know what my priorities are of being in council and like I just said, it's a five year term. And if like you've got to work with the people in the council office, but if you know if you're not getting those done, I mean we've got to work with you and you'll tell us what what we're doing wrong and what we're doing right. But if you yourself know you're not getting that done, you have to look at yourself and say, are you doing a good job? Are you the best person for this job? And if you're not doing it right, you've, you've got to work harder. You've got to try better. And you've got to ask yourself genuinely, are you doing it right? I think it was Keir that said earlier, there's been a few in the council who have coasted by for quite a few years and you don't want to become one of them. So you've got to, you are right. You've got to hold yourself accountable. And if you're not the right person, I think I am. I'm dedicated. I'm hardworking. If you find out you're not, you got to be honest with yourself, and that's personal accountability. Um, personally, I would be prepared to sign undated letters for the secretaries of both Danoon and South Carroll Community Council to the effect that if they passed a vote of no confidence in me, I would resign because I think that that is how you can demonstrate personal uh, accountability. Because if you haven't got the support of the community councils in the area, you shouldn't continue. And I would hope that all my colleagues here tonight would agree to that as well. The other point I would want to make is you're not electing one councillor. This is not going to be a one-party state. But there's only actually two SNP candidates standing, not three. They're going to have to work with somebody else. And when you think about it, when you're electing a team, you would want to have people with different backgrounds and abilities to make up that team. You might, for example, decide you want to have a woman councillor, in which case you'd give some support to Audrey. You might want a younger person, in which case you might give support to Kieran. Here. And then you've got a range of old men here. Oh, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. Young man over there. <laughs> I, I wasn't quite sure who was the youngest there, but there we are. But then, you, so you've got a choice, but you, you, you've got to think about putting together a team of people to represent you because they can keep one another on their toes. And I'll keep some of them on their toes if you like me, but there you are. Uh, yes, being a, a member of a party obviously gives you a bit of a, uh, advice and support. Uh, you know, whenever you need it, it's, it, it's always there. But um, you know, we, we're elected by you, um, so we're obviously we have to be accountable to you. Um, and, I, and I would like to think that uh, you know, if, if if everyone thought I was doing something wrong, then please tell me. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's the only way I'm, 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 I'm going to, you know, help you guys in, uh, in, the, in the end up. So, um, yes, no, totally accountable. And, and, and as um, Mick says, you know, the, the three of us, um, whoever's elected, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, we have to work together. Um, and, and, and that has to, we have to work as a team that way. So, um, yeah, totally, you know, they have to be accountable. But there's always someone there for a bit of support. Being a member of a party, it's, it's always going to help. Uh, well, you know, what I would say is, uh, firstly, if you want to see accountability, then here's 30 pages of accountability. This is the SNP's manifesto for our guy on Butte, and this is full of commitments that we are standing by. Um, I would uh, like, to, like to say, as a, a political party, we are standing on promises and commitments, and uh, therefore, if elected, if we uh, maintain administration, then these are going to be... Uh, commitments that we will be holding by, these will be policies that we will be forming uh, to, to change our on Butte for the better. Um, I, I, this is possibly one thing that I, I do disagree on uh, with other candidates with because I think you know you need to weigh down the commitments uh, that you're going to hold by so that you can be accountable um, and real accountability is telling people what you're going to do and doing it. Accountability. If I'm lucky enough to be elected, I will, I hope, be what you want, what you're looking for. If not, I'll be the first to put my hand up and say, I'm not doing this job properly and I'll be going. But what I would like to ask is, what is your definition of the accountability that we should have? I just wrote uh, a few words, really, um, as they were speaking, and the things that stood out for me were, most of you said these things, or certainly some of them, and you've all done that, accountability, transparency, honesty, communication with the electorate, consensus, and team. And in my view, this is what the council should be, irrespective of your politics. It's all about team and putting party politics aside. So I will say uh, that all the people here uh, have filled me with a little bit of encouragement. I wanted to be out there, not here, because I wanted to ask questions. <laughs> um, they seem a really decent people. So I, I believe that whichever three elected will do a good job for our area. Would you please give them all a hand of applause, please? And finally, thanks everyone for coming and don't forget to vote.